The following video will have a man rambling about tips and tricks about Inscription Act 1. Please enjoy. Hey, let's check it out, Rada. Uh, for those that have been watching the channel so far, I have done a complete playthrough of the main series of Inscription. Absolutely love the game. I could play that game for hours. I have it on Steam and PlayStation 4. Now, there's one thing that the game doesn't tell you, and that's, like, don't, don't get wrong, the game's full of secrets, so of course there's a lot of stuff it doesn't tell you, but there's also a lot of secrets that aren't tied to anything. Like, they're linked to maybe s secrets that you have to do to um, go further in the story, or there's just some that aren't connected at all to the story or aren't connected to achievements. Like, for instance, there's certain cards that have special interactions with other cards, but unless you physically do that, you've got no way of knowing that's actually a thing. So, that's pretty much what this series is going to be. I've played the game extensively, and I'll, I'll be honest, I've dicked around with it for so many, like, hours on, when it, like, on end. I've f basically broken the game constantly, and I've been sharing photos on my like Twitter and Facebook and it's been hilarious but one thing I will say before I get into the tips and tricks is there's two things I will not be covering for starters I will not be covering any like secrets or such that would pretty much be story related so for instance the stink bug as I just said yeah I'm not gonna cover that to the dagger with the wolf or anything like that or the um puzzle boxes that you have in Leshy's room where you have to match up the tiles in the right way to get five damage i'm not going to talk about any of that because technically you need to solve them anyway for progression of the story so they're story related and they're not technically a secret like with the save code for the stink bug all of that you technically learn just by playing the game they're not stuff that you would just randomly stumble across, or there's not stuff that you aren't properly told. So, I won't be mentioning any of that, and for the other thing I'll be mentioning is, at the very end of this video, uh, the Ouroboros, the most powerful card technically in the game, and one that you can abuse very easily in any f act of this game, I will show you one of two ways to abuse it at the end of this video. So if you're interested in seeing like how to make the Ouroboros broken in Act 1, look forward to the end of the video because I will be sharing that in detail, especially because by that time I think I would have shut up. So for starters, uh, the tip number 5, limit your deck. Now at least for the first two runs, if not the first three runs, you're not supposed to beat the game, especially on the first run. For those that have played through the game, if you think you can then like drop into a new game, run straight to the safe, get the stink bug and do all of that, you physically can't because if you try to use the code on the safe during the very first run, you're going to open it up and there's going to be a pile of meat. That doesn't work. And the other part of this is during the first two runs at least, you're going to go against what's called the unbeatable bear board. Now, this pretty much is just a board where he plays eight grizzly bears that have flying defense, which pretty much it's beatable, don't get wrong. Myself and others have done it, but technically it's not supposed to be beaten because you physically don't have the ability to progress to act two at this current stage. You haven't gone to get the process to get the knife, which you need the stink bug for, you haven't got the thing in the cuckoo clock, you haven't got any of that. So, what you what you should do in your first at least two runs when you know you can't technically beat the game, is limit your deck because for those that are for those that haven't played Inscription, when you die in a run and you don't get all the way into if you don't get all the way to Leshy and beat him and you actually die anywhere or just die against Leshy, you will be given what's called a death card. Which, when saying, like, after he drags you into the next room, you'll start to make it where first he'll give you three cards from your deck, you'll pick a cost from one of them and that'll be the card's cost. The next one will be he'll pick three creatures from your deck and he will tell you to pick 
one of them to mark the, your card's health and attack. The final one will be the sigils, which is the, the abilities the card has. Now, this is where I say limit your deck, because you can actually make some really broken cards just by doing this like particular method. For instance, on the PlayStation version, which I can show up a picture of it right now, I create a card called the Jade which is named after a member of our channel. Now, he is one of the easiest examples because one of the prize cards you can get from being a boss is called Gek. He's useful just simply because he's a no-cost card that's a one-by-one. One. So he's something that can be played and attacked the same turn you play him and doesn't require a cost, so you can also use him as a tribute, which is really good. But what makes him especially valuable is that he has no cost. So if you get to the death card and he's picked, you can literally pick a card, like you can pick him and then do whatever card you're making, no matter what its stats are, it now has no cost. So you can, if you get in your hand, you can just play it down. For the attack and health, one thing you should do is the wolf, if you can ever get to a campfire, raise the wolf's attack or health at least once. Uh, I don't think at the first two to three round, like three pathways of it, I don't think you can go more than like one upgrade per campfire, because I think that's like unlocks later. But the wolf is going to be something that, like if you limit your deck to only a few cards, you can actually get the ability that your wolf will be most likely chosen as one of the cards that gives attack and health. So for instance, like the card I showed you, which is the Jade. It was a 4x2 because I found a campfire, powered my wolf's attack up by 1, and then when it was chosen, I gave its 4x2 to Jade, which made him literally something with the that's slightly stronger than a wolf, but I could just slap him down without any cost, which is already great. That's like really good to have in any situation. But then you move on to the sigils. This is exactly where the point I'm making comes across because when you pick when it picks three cards from your deck with sigils, the less cards you have with sigils in your deck, the easier it is to set up the death cards you want. Because if you say if you only have three cards in your entire deck with sigils, now it has to pick one of them. And the way it, the, what makes this especially good is if you sacrifice cards along the way to other ones, it will allow you to make combinations of effects that are exactly what you want. Um, for instance, the best example is of course the Jade's one, where during a run I on the PlayStation I got the Field Mice and I got the Cockroach. I sacrificed the field mice to the cockroach, which pretty much made it that the field mice's ability is it copies whatever card is played and puts a copy of it in your hand. So for instance, every time you played the cockroach, it would add a cockroach back to your hand with the field mice sigil and the undying sigil that it had. The other ability that, as I just said, the undying one, it had the ability that if it dies, it goes back to the hand as well, which is perfectly fine. But when you put them together, that gives you infinite resources. And when you put it on a card like the Jade, which was a 4x2, with no cost, you literally have a card that's an infinite army and an infinite resource material. Because literally every time you play the Jade, thanks to its Field Mice ability, it would create a copy of it to your hand. If it ever died, it would also go back to your hand. But each Jade had the Field Mice ability. So if you played one, you got one to your hand. You could play the next one, and then get a third one to your hand, and literally, if you draw that in your first turn, you could slap all four down and attack for massive damage. And it's stuff like that which you can easily do if you limit your deck, because the way it works is combining your sigils and making it less likely to have too many sigil cards in your deck means that you can kind of control exactly what death card you're making. Now if you were to compact your deck with too many cards that's going to make it a lot harder to get the results you want which is why that like you should spend the first two rounds when you're less likely to have a lot of cards spending those two times making like 
setting up to making these perfect death cards is exactly what you want to do so that way literally you could make your life 10 million times easier come later game a perfect example for a combination which if you can literally pull it off and put it on a card is equally as good as a jade which the black goat and the cockroach you probably won't get the cockroach in your first run because it's a bone card but you'll probably be able to get the chance to get it in your second run when bones are introduced and what happens is if you can give the but the cockroach's undying ability to the black goat you literally have an infinite resource material which something that's something that you'll see later in this video if you watch all the way to the end um where it's like the black goat can be sacrificed for almost anything and being that it's also undying it keeps going back to hand so you've got an infinite way to summon the most powerful card in your deck but the, like that's pretty much the long and short of that tip so moving ahead you've got the puzzles now as I said I wasn't going to discuss the puzzles or the certain particular ones that are related to the story but there are some that you may not know actually exist for instance the one thing the game doesn't tell you is the cuckoo clock has a second compartment at the top now if you set your clock to 11 and I mean just straight up 11 o'clock what will happen is the top part of the cuckoo clock will open up and give you a ring when you start inscription do this straight away the moment you can stand up run to the cuckoo clock and activate that because what it will do is if you put 11 o'clock into the cuckoo clock and it spits out the ring you will keep that every single run you will never lose that ring and it is important because when you get to Leshy's fight before you fight the final boss in act one he will give you the chance to get boons which are basically abilities you can get to make the boss fight a little easier sometimes it could be anytime you draw a card for your turn you can search for whatever the hell you want it could be a draw two there's other ones but they're the two you kind of want to go for but but he doesn't just give you these boons he gives you trials just like you find in certain sigils of the rest of the game now one of the trials is the trial of the ring and there's only two ways to succeed at this game this trial which is like the other way is way too gambly because what happens is the trial of the ring means that you have to present a ring just to win and either a you have to have be wearing the ring that you get from the cuckoo clock or b he'll draw three cards from your deck like he does with any other trial and one of them has to be either the ringworm or the ouroboros because both of them count as a ring if you do not draw either of those cards you fail or if you don't have the ring you also fail because like you need one or the other however if you have the ring like if you get the ring from straight off the get-go you pass and you will never lose a ring so pretty much any single run you do if the ring boon shows up you just select it you win and you can get to pick your boon so that's just something to keep in mind because it's rather perfect um and it's something the game doesn't tell you about technically like it's you, you kind of can tell there's a top compartment but you don't really get like notifications on it at all until act three when there's a like little secret that tells you that the cuckoo clock has something extra and that's for an entirely different secret so like that's just something to keep in mind other things involve like as i said i was going to discuss the cardboard like the the card boxes or the wolf knife where you get the um you do this get the knife so that way you can progress however the painting is different the painting will like every time you get up you can see the painting and every single run the painting will be different and what it will, it will display is it will display pretty much what your field will look like and it will be telling you to put two certain cards on the field so you look at those cards and if you can pull that off go for it because it will give you benefits the first time it will give you the four leaf clover which basically means that if you play if you have the four leaf clover when he, you go to any single spot that lets you pick between three cards 
if none of the three cards link that you want, it lets you just try again with a new set of three cards. So that way you've got a second chance of something better. The second time you do it, you get a candle, which basically gives you your third life. And mind you, both both of these two things, as well as the next one, you keep. So even if you die in this round, next round you come along, you will keep that third life, and you will keep the clover. So that's just something to keep in mind. The third one, though, is the important one. At first, when I played this, I thought this was actually a very bad thing. But after playing Casey's mod, it's actually a very good thing, because if you match up a painting's like card setup for a third time, it will give you a B wooden carving. What that will do is if you bring that to the table, it will turn all of your squirrels into bees. Not only does it make them a one by one with flying, so you've now have instead of having squirrels, you have the bees that can attack, which is pretty good, but and they can be sacrificed. However, they also have the ability to get buffed by the totem while the totem buffs other things. So for a perfect example, if you have the bug totem where it's got the bug head with a, any other sigil, no, normally that would only equal the, the other bugs in your deck, but now it can equal to the bugs that you now have as your quote unquote squirrels. For instance, if you have the Field Mice ability, you will basically have infinite bees to just throw out and just constantly tribute or constantly attack with, or hell, constantly block with, um, unless the creature's flying, because they don't have flying defense. But what makes it especially good on top of that is uh, some of the strategies that I've come up with this is actually again infinite resource like another infinite resource one is ironically enough i just made a joke about this calling it the bugs bunny strategy if you have the bug the bug totem head with the sigil of the bunny rabbit which pretty pretty much means that anytime you play a card with a sigil you get a bunny rabbit to your hand that is a good combination because literally every time you summon a bee it will put a rabbit in your hand which means you always will have two tributes on your first turn no matter what so you will not have to worry about like waiting a turn to play something like the wolf uh so it's pretty good in that respect and it's not like it, it's not like you have to worry about getting the totem head anyway because after you get the wooden bee no matter like after that run is officially done if you say if you die and you start a new run one thing you will notice is that you from that point onwards start with the bug head as your totem head you just have to get to a totem spot and try to get a body to go with it but you will always start with the bug head now because your squirrels have been turned into bees which is pretty good it lets you set up quite easily but anyway like that's pretty easy to figure out and it's very much well worth doing uh, if you don't want to, feel free, especially because there is an achievement related to the squirrels. But honestly, th this has like a bit more potential, especially because the bees with flying can also make it easier to attack and kill your opponent without much issue of waiting a turn or two. Because they could just fly over most of your enemies and while still blocking their attacks against you. Uh, next thing though, for tip number three, is weak made strong, as I call it. Now, when you're playing through the game, you're going to be tempted to go for the strongest or the, like, just things that are crazy. Like, you'll see the prize cards and you'll see all these good ones, like the Uli Ruli and all of that. You don't want them. If you can help it, avoid, the, like, don't touch the Great White, don't touch the Bear, don't touch any of them. Because you can make your value up with the Ouroboros. And you can make it up with stuff like the like if for the surprise cards like death, you could um you can get make your value up with your death cards and you can make it up with the prize cards being like the mantis god or the Ouroboros. When it comes to everything else, be it the great white, the grizzly bear, anything like that, majority of them just avoid. What you want to do is you want to go for the weaker stuff, 
that are easier to summon but have good effects and use them to power up other stuff. For a, perf for a few perfect examples is like the ants. The ants are very easy to collect if you're aiming for them and they start off as weak but the more ants you have on the board the stronger they get. So if you have any one of the many strategies I could mention that give you the resources to play more than one ant you basically can give yourself that full-on onslaught like straight off the bat because the ants each gain one attack per ant on field so if you have four ants they all have four attack which turns something extra weak into incredibly strong automatically but especially what you want to do this entire point is not just to make them alone but to power them up with other card sigils like if you put a di certain sigils on the ant like the death touch where they'll kill anything they hit that's great because then you're just perfect able to steamroll people or the warren the warren is a card that when you tribute a card you play it and then it adds a rabbit to your hand one thing the game doesn't tell you though is if you were to put a sigil on the warren the bunny rabbit will also get the sigil for a good example is if you tribute the black goat for the warren and now the warren is a triple blood cost meaning that you can sacrifice it for almost anything in the game what the game doesn't tell you is the moment the warren gets summoned then the bunny that gets put in your hand will also have that same like almost anything cost where you can play it down then tribute it for the ouroboros or the say if you did go for a great white or a bear you can just tribute a bunny f like and slap it right down without anything to worry about so it's you got stuff like that. I've spoken in length on how good the field mice is because if you can put the field mice on any other card, that's going to give you a major step forward because just of how abusive that ability is. And one of my favorite cards to mess with in terms of weakness is the beehive. The beehive is a beautiful resource machine that you need to abuse. What you need to do is you need to make sure when you get the beehive you see if you can aim for a campfire to buff its health up at least once so that way it's on like four or something health and then give it a number of sigils like if you give it the spike symbol you create what i call the hornet's nest where you're creating bees that can fly sure but now that if they get attacked they sting your opponent back and mind you the reason why i'm saying that is because for those that don't know when the beehive is attacked every time it gets attacked you get a bee added to your hand and of course it gets the sigil of whatever the beehive has so if you the beehive has the hornet's nest or as i call it where the beehive has the um the spike ability not only does it flick the opponent for one point of damage but it puts bees in your hand with spike or it's like if you give it the blood cost or if you give it the field might ability for infinite resources or the undying ability there is so much resource material that you could give the beehive that basically means that you will have any number of ways to have resources for literal days the beehive only costs one blood meaning it you could literally play it on your first turn and unless you got like the world's worst luck getting absolutely nothing because i don't know you've gone to the trader and bought so many pelts that now your deck's just full of them you Ba the beehive is literally going to be a great way to give you both resources and if you need it bees to attack with so if you can I would definitely aim for this type of um, situation now for point number two uh, planning ahead which symbols to avoid and which symbols to go for now for this point, when you're looking at the map, watch what sigils are coming up, not just what's the th ones that are directly in front of you. Because, for instance, if you're on your very first run and you're divide, like you're looking at your pathways, and you're kind of got a, like a slight di like diversion between two different paths. If one path gives you the ability to get, say, I don't know. It get get a free card like you'll have the question mark card where you get to pick between three cards or you've got the other way which gives you a chance at like the beast sigil 
I'd go with the question mark because it'll allow you to pick which card you get and not just get random crap. But at the same time, there are other ones which are very... The ones you want to avoid if too early. Like, if you come across... If you look up ahead in one path and the trapper is coming up. But between now and then, you're not going to have a good boss fight. So you're not going to get the money to pay him properly. There's no real point because unless you're getting, like, I'd say two wolf pets and maybe a golden pelt from him per time you meet him literally it's a waste of you even going to him or if the mycologist is coming up in some runs if you see the big ass mushroom later and shit down one path if you have two cards that you do not want to fuse avoid it like the plague because while the mycologist is good in most occasions sometimes you could come across a situation where you have cards that are you, you've made a strategy that's really good, especially because you have two of a card that work really well together. But if you come across a mycologist, what he's going to do is he's going to fuse those cards together, and sometimes it can wreck your strategy completely. So, it's always a good idea to look further down the map, especially because if you scroll forward once, or just press the forward button once, what happens is you get kind of a top-down view of the map. You can see a little bit farther, not not too much but you can see a little bit farther and see what sigils are coming up and if they are going to be either useless to you or just detrimental in general don't don't go that way for a, an even better example is if you go to a place like say if you go to one of the locations where there's going to be the resource person who's going to give you supplies if you have three supplies and you do not want a pack rat that th that's definitely a place to avoid. Like, don't get wrong, pack, tr pack rats are good, but if you can't afford to keep filling your deck with other useless crap, don't, av like, it's no point trying to grab it, because, say if you've already got something that you've given a pack rat to, it's kind of pointless to go for another pack rat. But, at least that, that like, this particular point's kind of easy to, to explain and move across, so that's just literally long and short of it keep an eye on what's happening and what's coming up but then we move on to the final tips and tricks of this video which is the hidden secrets or in this case the cards that have abilities that you don't know about or you might not have known about now for those that don't know the Ouroboros and its abilities it's pretty much the easiest one to get out of the way the Ouroboros is the only card in the entire game that has an extra bit to its effect that is not written anywhere, uh, except for like descriptions of the Ouroboros, because it has the Undying Sigil, which for any other card, when that card dies, it goes back to the hand. However, for the Ouroboros, the reason why that's different is because every time it dies, it does go back to the hand, except every single time its attack and health will go up by one. And that stays no matter what run you're on. So if you, during one run, you power it up to like 5 attack and health, but then you lose that run. Next time you come across the Ouroboros as a prize card, it will have 5 attack and 5 health. So you can literally keep buffing it up, which you'll see me do like in preparation for Act 2 later on in this video. But the Ouroboros is the only card in the game that has this ability. And it's like, it's a really good ability. It also applies to a, I found out how to do an infinite Ouroboros loop with said situation. So, uh, it was a lot, it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't think I did it on my, this video, I did it on my PlayStation 1. But one situation I did was I applied the field mice to Ouroboros. And this is one of those interactions where the game doesn't tell you you can do. Especially because... If you didn't know about this interaction, you would never know about it. The field mice allows you, as I said, to copy whatever gets played that has a sigil. So if you put that on the Ouroboros, you basically can give yourself an infinite amount of Ouroboros. And why that's especially good is because the Ouroboros themselves all share the same attack and health no matter how many you have, because technically there's only one in the game. So if you were to play one, and then another one gets out to your hand. And say that you then tributed that Ouroboros for like a Mantis God. 
the Ouroboros that you just sacrificed goes back to your hand, but now both the ones in your hand have one extra attack and one extra health added onto their stats because they both share the same stats. Other cards to include in like that little fun interaction is, for instance, the Mantis. There is just a normal Mantis in the game which can attack two different ways, and with that particular card, there are many cards in the game that have what's called the Turn Sigil, which after one turn of being on the board, they evolve. They usually it's like raven eggs into ravens, or it's usually wolf cubs into wolves. There's a whole bunch of different situations with that, but the Mantis is one is literally the only card in the game that goes a step further. Because if you put that sigil on a Mantis, it evolves into the Mantis God, which or is basically already powerful, and it can attack three different ways. The only difference is it's going to be even more powerful than a normal Mantis God. Because every other card that evolves just turns into the card with the same stats as the card would normally have. Whereas this card, the Mantis God usually has a 1x1 one one that can attack three ways. With the Sigil that, evol like, that evolves the card, that's no longer the case, it actually gets a bit stronger. So that's just something to look, interested, like, look forward to if you want to play around with that. And... If you have the Bug Totem, like I said earlier in this video, you give it an extra sigil, so it's got even more abilities to screw around with. But then you have the final thing about this point. The campfires I mentioned earlier that allow you to buff your creatures. There is a risk, I should mention, of them, where later on you'll find that you'll be able to start sacrifice... Not sacrifice, you'll be able to power up your cards more than once so like after you power it up it will say do you want to stay stay on the fire a little bit longer to try to get more benefits now normally on certain cards you would cho choose to say no because that is definitely a gamble because the reason why they say they offer that is because at random times your card will then just be randomly sacrificed it'll be removed from your deck and you will basically have it deleted from that run you can probably come across another version of that card later, but it will be gone. Now, there's actually a way to get around this and then make later campfires actually just free buffs because there are certain cards that have a unique interaction with those campsites. If you were to put a ringworm or anything with the death touch ability, which for those that don't know, it basically is what it sounds like, where anything with the death touch, if it attacks an opponent, no matter what their stats are, they will instantly die uh, from pretty much after the attack. It's guaranteed, unless you're in the cases mod where there's an ability that counters that. But in this particular case, with the man with the um, ringworm and the anything that has death touch, if either of them are fed to the tribes people, and you actually manage to well have them die, like have them actually kill the creature and it, you get bones for it. The next time you hit a campfire, mysteriously all the tribes will, will be gone. They will, like all they'll say is maybe or something they ate. It's pretty much telling you that your last stunt had killed the tribe people and now from that point onwards, any campfire you find, you basically get free buffs. And this actually relates to my previous point of planning ahead because if you kill the campfire people quite early it means that you can actually target and aim for campfires during the rest of your run because you'll know you're going to get free attack buffs or free health buffs for nothing no cost no nothing because the trade tribes people are dead so the only risk is gone so that's just something to keep in mind and as I said at the end of this video, like you'll see an infinite Ouroboros loop, there's several ways to do this. My first way of doing the infinite Ouroboros loop is using a black go cockroach loop, which as I said, it pretty much equals in you play the Ouroboros by giving the black goat the undying ability of the cockroach. You play a squirrel, you attribute it, play the goat, you attribute the goat, play the Ouroboros. Then what you can do is you can tribute the goat to play the Ouroboros as I said, but then you can tribute the Ouroboros for the goat. 
and literally you can just keep tributing each other back and forth over and over to buff the Ouroboros as much as you damn well please because there is no limit like the only limit to how high, how high you can raise a Ouroboros' attack is how much patience you have because there's no time limit there's no because the black goat only has one blood cost it can tribute the only the Ouroboros to summon itself and then you could tribute the goat to summon the Ouroboros and thanks to the goat having the undying symbol thanks to cockroach just like the Ouroboros is the undying symbol it's basically an infinite loop between the two going back and forth constantly until you're at your desired attack so it's an easy way to get the Ouroboros to an infinite power and the other way I did it which I did on the PlayStation was as I said get the Jade I gave he had the field my ability and the undying so he was basically just infinite resources and I pretty much just did that until I got I had like I think I had the Ouroboros with also that had the field mice and what happens is I sacrifice two jades play an Ouroboros sacrifice two jades play an Ouroboros tributed both Ouroboroses for the J for um for another Ouroboros so that way he got the buff and I literally just kept repeating the process because jades were infinite fodder and you can tribute Ouroboroses for other Ouroboroses so you just keep going back and forth over and over again until you got the desired attack you wanted and this is also kind of linked to the whole planning ahead but this is for like an entirely separate stage because the one tip I could give you as a above all tips is if you play Inscription Act 1 if you can play the Ouroboros and buff him up at least to a t like probably like 10 attack if not more because that way he's literally something that will wreck acts 2 and 3 but if you can raise him as high as you can have the patience for per round because the higher he is per round the more advantage you're going to have during the following act for instance in this particular like at the end of this video you'll see I loop the hell out of it and power the Ouroboros up like an insane amount I don't remember how high I made him go but you'll see that at the end of the video but yeah so if he's above 10 attack he's going to be easily able to do like plenty of demolition in act 2 and act 2 is actually where there's another strategy to buff him up even further because there's ways to literally abuse the hell out of the Ouroboros for acts 1 and 2 and then act 3 is really when you just want to like use him to destroy everyone because he's actually not that hard to get in act 3 um, act, every act he's pretty easy to get but still so at least in the end that's pretty much what I have to say I hope some of this has been helpful and or just entertaining at the very least uh, if there's anything that you guys didn't understand or if there's anything you guys have questions on feel free to leave a comment down below because I will be watching the comments and I will be happy to answer any questions you guys have but for now my friends hope you guys have enjoyed the video uh, again if you want to see the infinite Ouroboros loop that I do for this particular run that you're seeing behind me feel free to watch the end of the video if you don't want to watch the end of the video that's fine like this is the end of where the tips and tricks is so that's just it's just up to you whether you want to see it but yeah hope you guys have a good day and I'll see you next time
Thank <laughs> you. 